This program is recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. The audio for this program can be heard on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. The Eau Claire City Council Candidates Forum, recorded Thursday, March 10th, 2016. Good evening and welcome to our Meet the Candidates Forum. I'm John Murphy, representing WYY 790 Radio, and I'll be serving as your moderator tonight. We appreciate your attendance tonight to learn more about the candidates and their positions on various issues that affect our community. We want to thank Chippewa Valley Technical College for hosting the event at this conference center, and this event is sponsored by the Leader Telegram, WQWT18, WYY, Chippewa Valley Community Television, and Eau Claire Area Chamber of Commerce. Eau Claire citizens have a city council election each year. Last year, voters elected representatives for each of the five geographic districts in the city, and next year, the city council president will be up for election. This year, 2016, voters will elect representatives to serve three-year terms in the five at-large seats. In addition, there is an election to fill the remaining two years of the District 1 Council seat. It became vacant last year because of the death of City Council Member Dave Duax. The City Council appointed Tim Tewalt to fill the vacancy until the next election. I will introduce each of tonight's candidates in a moment. And the format for the forum tonight is as follows. There are four questions. Each candidate will be given one minute and 30 seconds to answer each question. Each candidate will also have a two-minute closing statement. The timekeeper will give signals at each 30-second mark and a stop signal to the candidates during all of the questions. It's always a good time for me to ask the candidates, any of you have a problem with the concept of stop? Because sometimes we do have to tell you to stop when it means stop. Don't, don't run through the light, so there you go. Uh, because of the time limitation, there will not be an opportunity for questions from the audience. The first to answer each question will be rotated between candidates running for the same district seat to assure fairness. The candidates for city council are Kate Beaton, Eric Larson, Catherine Emanuel, David Strobel, Michael Sean. In addition, one other name will be on the at-large ballot. However, Jody Thompson has informed us that she's withdrawn from the race and will be unable to serve if elected. But that will be on the at-large ballot. For District 1, Tim Tewalt and Heather DeLuca. Chippewa Valley Community Television is video recording the forum tonight. There will be scheduled broadcast times for tonight's forum, as well as on-demand viewing at Community Television's website, cbctv.org. The seating order for tonight's forum was determined by random drawing. All candidates will have the opportunity to answer each question. The first to answer question will be rotated among the candidates. So after all the disclaimers, let's begin the candidates forum. And we will start, uh, question one will go to Kate B. Are TIF districts in Eau Claire being used effectively what, if anything, would you propose to do differently in the future? Uh, yes, I do believe that TIF district districts are being used effectively. Um, if we look at the uh, previous TIF, TIF districts that have existed in Phoenix Park and then the Oakland Hills area, um, it seems that they've been extremely uh, successful. Um, now one in five jobs in Eau Claire uh, exist downtown, and the Oakland Hills area um, is the highest tax revenue um, it has the area with the highest tax revenue. So I, in my opinion, I think that that is extremely successful and should continue. Um, I think it's important to remember when we are um, looking at TIF districts, especially downtown, that we protect historic buildings, um, that we're not tearing down buildings that deserve to be there. Um, I think that the livery is a really great example of how um, a historic building was used uh, respectfully and effectively to create something new and beautiful. Um, in, the, in the future, I, I would like to refer to some research that was done by Tom Kemp, uh, our own Tom Kemp from uh, UW-Eau Claire. He found that TIF districts are most likely to succeed when uh, a city is being financially responsible in other areas. Uh, so I, I feel that that has been happening um, so far, but in the future, I think that that should continue to happen. Thank you. Same question to Eric Larson. Thank you. I agree with Ms. Beaton that uh, we in Eau Claire have used our TIF districts very responsibly. 
Uh, we're very conservative with the use of district, district, TIF districts here in Eau Claire. If you look at many other communities in Wisconsin, the size of Eau Claire and some a little bit larger, some of them have as many as 30 TIF districts. We have 11, and uh, more than half of those are closed. So, uh, it, and if you look at it, I believe our first TIF district was in the Oakwood Hills area, which began as uh, with no development at all. Of course, we know what's out there now. Uh, a good deal of tax revenue was created and raised because of the development in that area. And with the uh, tax levies, limits that we have in place now in Wisconsin, it becomes even more critical for us to create tax increment in creative ways. I think we've done that quite well. Uh, and in particular, now we have ongoing TIF districts in downtown, and uh, they have done very well for our city. And we've used them not just to develop uh, the housing and the, the businesses, but to create a place in downtown that's attractive for the region and uh, is attractive for keeping and employing college graduates here. Uh, I stop. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, the same question to Catherine Emanuel. Yes, I think that our financing tools have been effective to the letter of the law and to the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law is to use this public finance tool to encourage growth that would not otherwise occur. This finance tool has given a jump start to projects that have significantly changed the landscape of Eau Claire for the better, from development in industrial parks to a significant redevelopment to our downtown, including the new parking structure, mixed use development, and the gem in the heart of our city that is the confluence. The benefits of the finance tool span well beyond public infrastructure. We see private market benefits, such as an emerging workforce with hundreds of young employees who are choosing to make Eau Claire their home, to unique hotels that we as locals will get to enjoy, to cultural activities every night in our city. I think that we should put together a policy that allows carefully vetted projects to perhaps use the TIF finance tool throughout the entire city, and I am in support of that. As one civic leader recently told me, Eau Claire is entering a magnificent time of golden years, and each tool that our city can leverage will continue to put Eau Claire on the map as a place that is resilient, that moves forward, and thrives. Thank you. Uh, same question uh, to Michael Schoen. Thank you. I also, yes, I also believe that the TIF gives a value for economic reason in downtown areas for the campus project and also the new parking lot on Russell Street. Also, back in time, the Phoenix Park also used it directly and other important as the industrial park for commercial use. Uh, in the future, the city is planning to create a new TIF policy, we have rules for creating a district for, for uh, use in the future. Thank you. And the uh, question uh, next to David Strobel. Does that work? Uh, um, um, I could agree and disagree with my, my fellow uh, council members and candidates up here a little bit. Um, I think TIF is a, a very good development tool, um, it, but my understanding of TIF was always that it was meant to build infrastructure to, to get your property ready for development. And I think where we've gone a little bit different on that lately is, is some of the uh, private developer incentives. And I think those are okay to a point, but we may have opened that door. And, and to be quite honest, if I was a developer now, I don't know that I would not come to the city council for a developer incentive. Um, if I was building in a TIF. Um, so I think if you look at as close as Altoona, you know, with their River Prairie, they, they put a lot of money into infrastructure there. And um, I think they only did one small developer incentive, so that's the first tenant there opening. And all the other development out there, I don't think anybody is giving a developer incentive. So I would be cautious of that. Um, so I guess that's what I would want to be a little bit careful of. And I would also like to see our TIFs a little bit shorter than 30 years. 
think they go to public infrastructure like the parking ramp. I think another good place would be the parking ramp that we have downtown, the old Civic Center parking ramp. I think that's a great use of, of TIP on a public infrastructure. So there are places for it, but I'm just cautious of the development centers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strobel. For the benefit of uh, television and the audience here, let me restate the question again. Are TIF districts in Oak Park being used effectively? What, if anything, would you propose to do differently in the future? We next go to Tim Tewalt. Thank you. I think it's an excellent question, and boy, I love Eau Claire. I think we've seen some great growth through our TIF use. We've seen it downtown, we've seen it out at Oakwood. And it is a good question where we look at developing partnerships that help the town flourish, and we see a great balance between those public and private parts. So I think it's been a very effective thing. You know, what if anything would I change? Well, it's very interesting. Just Tuesday, we were in a work team to start asking that question. What is a TIP? When is it eligible? What should be the criteria for awarding that? And those are the factors that we want to do. So we have three main goals. The first starts with the but, or if not for this financing, what would we be able to do? We can remove blight, we can develop an industrial area, or a multi-use area. So I think the question that we look at is how can we best be best stewards of it? And I agree with much of the uh, ideas that people have already shared in the question. To be good stewards, to use those effectively as they fit. So that's my uh, understanding and use of tips. It's been a positive thing. And Eau Claire is just going to get brighter and brighter as we see the sun getting warmer. Thank you. Next we'll go to Heather DeLuca. Sorry about that. I am the last one to be talking about tips then. Um, many of the people have put out their definition, and um, the one thing that I think a lot of people forgot was the first thing on a tip is you need to, the property or the area has to be blighted. And then, after you've determined that it is blighted, then you, uh, if not for that tip, you would not be able to develop in that area, or people wouldn't be interested in developing in that area. Um, I agree that uh, with Mr. Larson that 28 to 30 years is quite a long time for a TIF district. Um, I also believe that Eau Claire has been a bit quick to offer the incentives to taxpayer dollars to offer to the developers to build. I just can't believe that here in Eau Claire, our Walmart, Oakwood Mall, RCU down in Phoenix Park, <coughs> Hutchinson, wouldn't build, have built their buildings there if we hadn't offered them incentives. I believe that if the area is, um, the need is there, the development will be um, something that a developer will be willing to do. I also am concerned that a lot of our, we're looking at building new, 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 and okay. I'm, out, I'm out of time. She's so. out of time. <laughs> take a breath, in fact, because you'll, you'll get the, the next question. You're coming up on our next round, so take yeah, a breath I, there. I forgot to watch the, for the, the time. So. That's okay, no problem. Uh, so this is the second question for uh, all the candidates here. What, as a city council member, can you do to ensure the public's investment in the Confluence Arts Center is adequately protected? And we will start with this question with Heather DeLuca. Okay, good. Okay, so um, I, did, I did what I was just, I'm just going to add a little bit from the first one <laughs> because um, I think that we have to um, go back and look at our existing infrastructure and our aging housing. It's great to have new things, but I think we also need to make sure that we're looking at the majority of Eau Claire is not in the new section, it's in the older section, so we need to make sure our taxpayer dollars is being used in that direction. Okay, so now I'm going to go um, to my second question. Um, uh, I wasn't in favor of the project initially because the state funding wasn't there, but I'm impressed at the way the city um, has um, surrounded the project and uh, brought forth and raised money. And so um, now I'm moving forward and um, going 
to support the project. Um, I think we need to look at the big picture. What worries me about um, the nonprofit is if it were to dissolve, do we have a contingency plan to cover if they're no longer going to take care of the theater? And also, um, do we already know what the ongoing costs are going to be? And uh, are we going to be able to um, cover those costs? Thank you. Let's uh, move that question now on to Tim Tewalt. Thank you. First of all, I want to give my compliments to the city managers, the city staff, who have worked really hard to ensure that we are protected on that project. They have built in milestones working with council to define what steps should come first, what should become second, and then we will give money out to let it out when that is met. And we've got those milestones, multiple parts along that project. We also look for due diligence for the states to participate, for the benefactors to participate, so that we were not at risk with our trusted uh, funds that we have from the city. Um, you know, and not only at the start of the project, but we've had that all the way through. Down the line, we'll see the same excellent uh, commitment to serving the public interest. There are always going to be changes. There are always going to be things we don't see, things we can't see, regardless how much I shake the magic eight ball to know which way to make decisions. Um, but we have a great tradition of making good decisions, wise stewards from our heritage, from our culture, and being responsible with the dollars. So whatever may come, I'm confident the city, the council, and the community will meet those challenges on. And I'm looking forward to us enjoying it in short order. Thank you. The question next goes to David Strobel. Uh, thank you. Um, I, think we've, I think the city has already done a, a great part of that to try to make it successful. I, three years when I sat up here, um, I, I was opposed to uh, a lot, a lot of it, but I guess I was opposed to city ownership. Um, I didn't want to be the city to be on the backstop for operating losses. Um, um, I, uh, I think the fixed subsidy that we have now that comes directly from Visit Eau Claire, uh, room tax money does not come from the city, and the city's not the owner of it anymore. It's uh, it's owned by a nonprofit. So I think we have a finite exposure for future operating losses, which will actually sunset over time. So I, I think that was good. I was also asked to be on the design committee. And I was extremely impressed with all the work that went into the design of the facility, um, all, the, all the wants and the needs that were boiled down into the final plan that's been put forth. Um, and I, I think we have, uh, you know, Visit Eau Claire is going to lead space there. That's uh, built in revenue. The, the university is going to share in uh, some of the costs as well. And uh, so I, I think if the facility is built without debt, um, I think it has a really good chance of succeeding. And Thank you, Mr. Strobel. The question we're working on now is what, as a city council member, can you do to ensure the public's investment in the Confluence Arts Center is adequately protected? Next, we go to Michael Sean. Thank you. There is a ownership group called, um, it consists of the city uh, manager and city's uh, council presidents, and there is a contract uh, that has signs uh, to protect the cities. And, also, we have a, a city uh, point represent called Conference Councils, which the financial, um, financial director who also work in with this group. So I mean, I'm pretty confident that um, they will go well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. Uh, next, the question to Catherine Emanuel. On my time on the council, I have worked hard to be a problem solver. Instead of finding ways to say no to progress, I've advocated for ways to responsibly protect and preserve what we have and what our community aspires to be. Protecting a sound public investment into the Art Center will be no exception. I'll share two examples. First, as a board member for Visit Eau Claire, I worked to approve funding that would contribute $200,000 a year from hotel room tax to operate funds of the community arts center. These funds will support day-to-day -day operations and complement our public investment. Second, our community can trust that even when outside forces threaten our public funding, I will communicate with the public 
and when necessary, I'll work to bring people together to amplify our voices to protect that funding. When the state temporarily rescinded their support for the Confluence Project, I gathered a group of supporters to the site, made our case to the press, and later that week, with many people advocating and many, many people working so very hard, millions of dollars of funding was restored to the project. Thank you. Next, let's move on with that question to Eric Larson. Thank you. I think it's important to, to recognize the work that's already in place to protect public funds with regard to the uh, operation of the Confluence uh, Performing Arts Center. I know that uh, from my earliest involvement in negotiations and uh, development work with the Confluence Project, I was uh, opposed to the public ownership of the building. It's now going to be owned by a, uh, a nonprofit organization and managed by a Confluence Council that was put together by uh, a Confluence Council task force, which I also served on. Our city manager, our uh, finance director, and our council president are all involved at some level in the, uh, uh, the management and decision-making structure of the, of the uh, Confluence project. Also, during the uh, negotiations of the development agreement, it was decided that the the uh, Performing Arts Center would be required to have a reserve fund available that would be used up in front of any public monies that might help uh, offset losses in the program. And the, the uh, public monies, if it ever did come to that, are capped at a million dollars. So a lot of work has gone into preserving and protecting uh, public assets in this project. And I, uh, I had one more point, but I'm, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Larson. And uh, Kate beat me with that question next. Well, I think um, it's important to look at what has made this project so strong to begin with. Um, I think that the public, private, and nonprofit par non partnership has really um, made this project as, su as successful as it is. And I think to continue uh, to go on in that direction to um, ensure that the university and the arts uh, the arts community continues to stay involved with this project is going to really um, lead to its success. Um, in addition, I think that um, the environmental sustainability um, is a growing priority in Eau Claire, and I would really like to see it be uh, see the building be LEED certified at a gold standard uh, at a gold level. Um, I think that this would, like I said, um, feed the interest in environmental sustainability, but also um, address operating costs and will uh, save on those operating costs. Um, lastly, I think that we should continue to develop downtown and more importantly, um, make sure that people, all people in Eau Claire feel welcome at this new um, facility, not only people who live downtown, but all people in Eau Claire, um, so that we can make sure that um, all of our residents are making it downtown and enjoying the, the new facility. Um, I'd also like to add that um, I am a, a graduate of the university here in Eau Claire, and I think that I am um, in a fair position to um, be a connection between the university, who um, has strong investment in the project, and the city, um, and all of the other investors as well. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. We're uh, halfway through our uh, questions uh, this evening. And let's move on to question three. And Catherine Emanuel will start off with this. What features should the city put into the Haymarket Plaza next to the Confluence Arts Center? Should it include a pedestrian branch to Phoenix Park? And if so, how could it be paid for? The public plaza is basically a pie-shaped piece between a mixed-use building and the Performing Arts Center. And I absolutely support a pedestrian bridge uh, to be added to the project. And the city should explore every avenue for uh, financing that, including seeking grant dollars, which I understand the city is pursuing. In addition to that, I advocated for and helped to raise funds for placemaking uh, the civic, um, excuse me, for a civic engagement tool that's called placemaking. And we brought that tool um, to our community, which brought citizens together to help dream and plan the public plaza. 
Many people in this room helped to donate funds to that project, and I thank you for believing in that meaningful exercise. Of course, the city relies on public engineers and architects to provide professional renderings of design. But instead of professional expertise only, our public plaza will emphasize our public place, the people's plaza, which will reflect our collective dreams. The results of the civic engagement planning include no duplication of other nearby park amenities, rather things such as fire pits and places for people to safely go and touch the water to many generations sitting and enjoying the area, to having a poop ditch, which would be pretty fun. This pie-shaped park will be in the middle of housing, restaurants, retail shops, and whether it's the public plaza or any other community endeavors, I will continue to support putting people in the middle of our civic life. Let's move on with that question to Michael Sean. Thank you. Recently, the city has conducted a survey, a study, um, asking people what they want to see happen in that area, in that plaza. And the city had come up with, citizens had come up with some questions and answers what they want to see happen there. They want to have a place where they can be relaxed, a benches, table, a place where they can listen to music and can see the river. And this is something they want to see a little place that they can stay here, people they want to hear. So some of this they want to see happen. Um, I think that while we attracting people coming downtown that we have those kind of bench and place for people to enjoy or listen to music. Um, and it will be easier for people who actually how do they pay? They I guess will be paid by uh, city capital funds and also do fundraising like uh, Pastor Mayor mentioned earlier. Um, and again, I'm going to go back that this will be bring more people downtown, be more attractive, we can come up with these ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sean. Uh, once again, let's uh, restate the question for everyone here. What features should the city put into the Haymarket Plaza next to the Confluence Arts Center? Should it include a pedestrian bridge, bridge to Phoenix Park? And if so, how could it be paid for? The question next goes to David Stroh. Uh, thank you. Um, I said we should have a skating rink down there, but nobody's listening to me. Um, I, and the, the kind that has a plastic, like they have up at the, you know, the hockey place there, so you can take it up in the summertime. I think in the wintertime, skating would be awesome down there, so that's my plug. Um, I, I think that, that we've had a process to engage the public, and I, I think they're getting a lot of feedback on that. And uh, um, like they do on everything, you get as much feedback as possible, and then you try to incorporate as much as you can into that plan uh, for the plaza. As far as the bridge goes, I, the, the bridge has been in concepts on plans downtown since prior to the Confluence project. Um, you know, but at some point it may be more of a want than a need right now. And uh, funding is always the issue. Um, my thing is, if it, I think if it ever gets built, though, I just want to make sure it gets done right. I'm not sure that the location shown in the most recent uh, um, schematic there from uh, the Confluence is the correct location for it. And I have great confidence in our, our city engineer, uh, Dave Silver, who can possibly, uh, I'm hoping that he's looking for DOT funding for any type of funding we can get for, for the bridge, uh, including uh, donations. So um, that's my hope. The question goes next to Tim Tewalt. Thank you. You know, the plaza would serve as that quintessential what is Eau Claire. It is a place to meet, it is a place together. It's been planned that that would serve day and nighttime meetings, perhaps a time to gather around the fire, um, look out at the water. Um, I don't live on the water, but I did get access to the water because I married up, and that family that I married into has a cottage on a lake. And it is wonderful to see. And it sets a tone that says we're in Eau Claire, and these are some of the things. We take time to reflect. We take time to enjoy the wonderful area. You know, should we have a bridge and how will it be funded? I would start with the radio and TV personalities. I'm sure they could just write a check. I say that time in check, uh, Chief, but um, <laughs> unless they're going to volunteer right now. But one of the things I look at that and say, that is a great question. And that is what we're going to go to the public with and talk. It is a dialogue. It is a way to connect with that. Is this something the public wants? Then we will see those doors open. And if not, we will look at those avenues and maybe not. So I think it's too early in the project to say definitely is that bridge going to be there. 
but I really support the public discourse of that. Thank you. Thank you. Me without my checkbook tonight, go figure. Uh, next, let's move on with that same question to Heather DeLuca. Um, uh, as far as the Haymarket Plaza, I think a river, a river walk would be an excellent way to move people through the area. Um, it could also um, be connected to the bike trail. The bridge, um, I think it's important to finish the project. I think we need to use the project and then let the need determine whether we need the bridge or not. Um, I think it's a little too early to put that um, into motion right now. Um, I think that you should have uh, areas to sit and eat, and uh, of course, if you're going to have the bike path nearby, you need bike racks for people to lock their bikes up so that they can then um, go and about and look at the um, shops or restaurants and take advantage of that area. Um, where would I find the funding? I would um, probably look to see if the transportation budget could um, provide some funding. The bike trail funding could give some. Uh, the nonprofit group could give some. Uh, grants would be great. And um, if you're going to go to look at the taxpayers for funding, I think uh, now is a perfect time uh, since all the uh, elections are on. If you want to put something on uh, the ballot and just get uh, their opinion, this would be an excellent time to do that. Thank you. Next, the question moves on to Kate Beebe. Uh, yes, I do support a bicycle and pedestrian bridge uh, near the confluence, as well as um, bike trails. Um, I think that it, it not only supports um, alternative transportation in our city, but it, it provides, um, it builds identi an identity of a place and provides a connection to the river. Um, it, it capitalizes on the history and culture of the confluence of our two rivers. Um, and it also connects people from the confluence to a highly trafficked area um, in Phoenix Park and the, the Farmer's Market Pavilion. Um, I think it's important to make it accessible to all people, especially at night and all seasons. Um, and most importantly, I think that this is an, an investment and not an expense. Um, this is something that will be iconic and will attract young people and new people to the city of Eau Claire. And, will encourage more people to, to move here. Um, I'd like to make it a priority in the Capital Improvement Fund because I think it's a worthwhile project. Thank you, we'll wrap this question up with Eric Larson. Thank you. I do hope we can build a, a bridge for the confluence. Um, it, I think it would uh, add a, an attractive amenity to a, a, an area that really, I hope, will turn into an iconic sort of visual um, area that, that advertises our downtown and makes it an attractive place to go and stay. I'd like to see a lot of seating there. I like the idea of fire pits. Um, and with regard to spending or the, the funding for the bridge, I agree with those who have said we should pursue grants, that uh, some giving might be uh, helpful, or would be very helpful. Um, but I, I want to point out that just recently, as we were going through street projects, we saved $600,000 by not putting a tunnel under Oxford Avenue for the bike trail. Instead, we'll have it at grade. So it, that's, that's about maybe even a little more than half the cost of that bridge. So I think the money will be there. Um, I do support the idea of it. I like the way that it would connect to Phoenix Park and, and the, the bike trails. There will there, uh, someday be a river walk along the, the east side of the river, and it would be, be good for us to have that uh, intuitive connection with the rest of the bike trails. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Just take a breath, because you'll start us off on the fourth question here. And it's been five years since the enactment of Act 10. They impose property tax levy limits have been in place longer. Do you support or oppose these measures? Why or why not? And we'll start with Eric Larson. Thank you. I do not support Act 10. Um, at the time that it was passed, I uh, had my opinions about 
labor law, and I thought that it did need some tweaking with uh, mediation arbitration laws and some of the things that had worked their way into the collective, collective bargaining process. But I didn't think that uh, we needed to blow up the system when it comes to public, uh, public labor. And really what Act 10 did was worse than blow it up. Because what we have now in Eau Claire is four distinct and differently managed groups of employees. We have emergency services with police and fire. We have general employees who are not represented, general employees who are represented, and then transit. And all of them have a different set of rules. The worst part uh, of that is that the general employees who choose to remain represented have restrictions on them that the other groups don't have. If a general employee group decides to be represented, they're limited in uh, wage increases by CPI, or Consumer Price Index. The rest of the employees are not. In my view, I think it actually puts more political pressure uh, on the whole employee relations system rather than less. In the past, it was controlled by both sides being required to uh, bargain in good faith and with the, with the understanding that if they did not, it could be overturned by an arbitration system. So that's my opinion on that. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Next, let's go to Kate Deaton. Um, I, uh, I strongly opposed Act 10 when it was going through um, the legislation. I didn't support it then, and I certainly do not support it now. Um, I think it's clear when we compare ourselves to surrounding states that Wisconsin is not doing well. We're seeing the effects of Act 10. Um, poverty levels are high. Unemployment levels are high. Um, in Eau Claire specifically, uh, one in five children are hungry. Um, hundreds of children in the Eau Claire School District are in the homelessness program. And I think that, um, I think that's just terrible. I think that uh, governments on all levels need to um, advocate for their constituents at the state level or at the national level to ensure that their constituents are being protected. <clears throat> so no, I do not um, support it. Um, I think that we should be opposing legislation like Act 10 and the um, tax revenue levy. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to Heather DeLuca. That's a good to press my button there. Um, I was opposed um, to Act 10 when it came through. Um, I feel that it has pushed a lot of our um, workers to retire at an earlier rate and um, really has made it very difficult for us to replace those workers. Um, it also has work, uh, limited workers' ability to negotiate um, their pay, their safety concerns, and just their general atmosphere in the workplace. I think workers um, need to have a say in what happens to them on an everyday basis if they are going to have some loyalty to their job. Um, property tax limits have also tied the local government's hands so that um, we aren't able to offer the same kind of wages. Uh, I know that it's been very difficult uh, for worker get workers out of the marketplace, and I know that our city police have been looking, they're short workers, and they've been looking and they've had to go quite wide out to the Dakotas looking for recruits. When they do get a recruit, they um, are also looking at other places like the Twin Cities, and they offer better pay and better wages and benefits, and we lose those workers to the other communities. We need to try to stay um, competitive so that we can get those positive recruits for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, once again, let's restate the question for everyone. It's been five years since the enactment of Act 10. State imposed property tax levy limits have been in place longer. Do you support or oppose these measures? Why or why not? Let's go to Tim Timont. Thank you. Well, somehow, I don't know how it was, I, I failed to get the phone call from the governor when the act was uh, talked about. And as you may or may not know, I work at CBTC. I've been a long-term employee here. And I'm a program director of the industrial mechanics area. And so I've seen the effects on our education in the K-12, the tech system, as well as the university. 
And, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. It reminds me going back a few presidents, maybe quite a few, when we go to President Nixon, who was faced with the inflation going and decided to react. And the react was, let's freeze wages, let's freeze prices. I get the gist of what they wanted to do, but I think it didn't work as effective as it did not work back then. Uh, over and over, we rediscover that giving local control is the best way. Giving people a voice is the best way. And I hope that the state legislators will take this anew and look at a very effective system. It'd be wonderful if we could control our costs, but we can't. We cannot then have our revenues locked. So we will see what comes up, but I'm hopeful that we can turn around from Act 10 and make it something positive. Thank you. Question moves on now to David Stroll. Thank you. Uh, my job as a city council person is to work within the budget constraints we have now. Um, I cannot control the state government. I think we do manage our resources differently now and, and perhaps more efficiently. And I think it also has helped us not raise your property taxes this year. I do think we treat our employees well. Uh, we had a new employee uh, handbook that we worked on. and. Um, I think the city is at three years of really solid budgets. We've implemented some new policies on fund balance and debt limits. Uh, we've changed our budget process to consider CIP and operating budgets at different times of the year. And I think with budget constraints, um, in the future, we're gonna need to concentrate on the core services, uh, roads, snow plowing, sewer systems, clean water, public safety, and, and uh, with limited budgets, I think that's potentially where we're gonna need to concentrate. And I think if the state wants to help us out, uh, they can give us our share of uh, taxes back. Thank you. The question now moves to Michael Schoen. Thank you. I also strongly oppose that tent. Uh, the transition has been very difficult for the city employees. The councils and city staff, we did the best we could to make the transition easy for our staff um, since the uh, attempt. Uh, I'm not in favor of the tax levy. Um, we should keep public tax low, but we still need additional funds to keep city services. Thank you. And we'll wrap up this question with Catherine Emanuel. Every fiber in my being opposes Act 10. The majority of the party in this state has been on a complete and total power trip. Act 10 has crippled local control to help people thrive. It's not just Eau Claire that becomes the loser with Act 10. The state has thrown financial handcuffs to every city, every county, and every public school in our great state. When levy limits are lifted, cities once again can better pay their workers, fix roads, and address important infrastructure issues. We need all governmental units to work together, not stifle our potential as a community. Thank you, everyone. And now we're moving into the uh, closing statements from our candidates here. And each candidate has two minutes for a closing statement. We will begin with Michael Shaw. Thank you. I want to take this moment to thank all the sponsors who sponsored this candidate forum. It is my privilege to have served Eau Claire for the last three years. This year I run for re-election for the city councils. I believe healthy cities need citizen involvement. Each one of us bring different point of views and experience for what we do. My vision is to build a stronger, safer Eau Claire for the benefit of our future generations. I also support funding for necessary programs such as police, fire protection, utility maintenance, veterans park and recreation programs. I, I also believe strong city in the business development efforts which tend to strengthen our neighborhood. At the end, I hope to hear your vote on April 5th. And thank you for being here, and thank you. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Sean. Uh, next, a closing statement from Catherine Emanuel. As I think about
about um, the journey of our city and all of the little work that has gone on, um, I think it's, the story is reflected in one word, and that is grit. Um, I heard a TED Talk recently from a teacher by the name of Angela Duckworth, and she defines grit as a passion for perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina, and grit is sticking with your future day in and day out, not just for the day and not just for the week, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. I see that this community works so hard. It's not just the people who are elected, it's so many other people in the community who are working hard. I think about what's on our horizon. A winter recreation park, new pickleball courts, food trucks, um, a pride that our city can have of winning the All-America City Award, a nationally award-winning civic engagement prize, to the work that we're doing to revitalizing older neighborhoods, and soon a groundswell of civic uh, conversations that will occur later this year to address poverty, and I hope better align our poverty alleviation efforts across many entities. I think Eau Claire is a gritty city. And I am so honored to be able to be here at this table, to be here in this community. And on April 5th, I ask for your vote. I would like to serve and provide grit leadership to help Eau Claire be more resilient, to move forward, and to thrive. Thank you to Catherine Emanuel. Uh, closing statement from Eric Larson. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone involved in organizing this forum. It's the second one I've been involved in. Uh, the first one was three years ago when I was first elected to City Council. And uh, it, it, it has been a very re rewarding experience for me. Uh, I, I've actually been uh, in some aspect of public service since I left high school, so basically all of my adult life. Immediately after high school I went into the Navy, came back, went into the National Guard, by the police department where I was for 28 years, and then three years ago became involved in the city council. I'm very proud of this community. I, I grew up here, um, and the years that I spent on the police department, I've gotten to know the city quite well. I know the issues that are faced in, in each of our different neighborhoods. I've helped to resolve those issues for many years. I've been involved in uh, city and, and working with city administration for the last 15 years including the time on the police department as I was promoted through the ranks and on the city council. I know our employees, I know the city organization, and uh, I'm very proud of our city, not just the community and the, and the engagement we see in, from our citizens, but our employees and the people who work every day to make this a greater city. I, I really love working with them. Um, as far as my impact on the city council in the last three years, one of the first things I did was uh, help to restructure the fiscal policy advisory committee. Since then, it's been, I think, much more responsive to the, the desire and the direction that the entire council wants to go. I felt like it was being uh, led by a small number of council members and uh, took action to change that so that the entire council has a, a word on it. I'm very proud of my strong support for the Confluence Project and the work that I did on the uh, Cons Confluence Council Task Force. Also, my work on the Plan Commission has been very rewarding. And uh, with the uh, Community Advisory Committee that reviewed our comprehensive plan. And I'm now, in fact, from this meeting, I'll be leaving to work on the Neighborhood Revitalization Task Force. And so I've been kept very busy over the last three years. Uh, it's a volunteer position, but, it, but we work hard to get it. You know, the, the campaigning is not easy. And uh, the time that we spend on it is very re rewarding, aside from, I mean, we don't do it for money, believe me. So, uh, and I'm very proud and happy to be serving our community. Thank you, Mr. Larson, and uh, closing statement from Kate Beaton. I am Kate Beaton, and 
and I am Love Eau Claire, and I am asking for your vote on April 5th. Um, before I start my closing statement, I wanted to thank the sponsors for um, holding this event. I wanted to thank everybody he here for listening, and I wanted to thank everybody at home who is listening from their couch. Um, so, I had the opportunity to get involved in our community by serving on the Comprehensive Plan, uh, on the Citizens Advisory Committee for the update of the Comprehensive Plan. Um, I was pleased that from day one we identified poverty as the number one issue. I was surprised, um, but I was pleased that my colleagues uh, thought that it was important that we talk about it and address it. Um, that was a year, a year long process and we, we continue to work on um, issues that face our city, including poverty and others. Um, during that same year, I was in the middle of founding um, Market Match, a program at the farmer's market that gives food share participants one dollar for every dollar they spend. It increases um, access to fresh, healthy, and local, locally sourced food, um, and it serves the community in more than, more than just that. It um, feeds people, it puts more revenue into the pockets of the vendors, and it grows our local economy. Um, in November 2015, I worked with the City Council to get public support and operational costs for Market Match while the actual matching money was being funded by the private sector. And I think that this is a perfect example of how the City of Eau Claire and the, the City Council can work to address poverty and other issues like it. So, um, I plan to continue to work, work on stuff like this and other initi initiatives including um, alternative transportation, um, bicycle infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, uh, public transportation, um, and I, I'm excited to do it. I'm excited to serve our community with my energy. Um, if you want to learn more about me and my issues that I'm interested in working on, you can visit my website at www.votekatebeaton.com. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you all. Um, I, it's a huge priority for me to listen to the people of Eau Claire um, and to respond to them. Um, and so please contact me if you're interested in talking. Um, and finally, I hope to earn your vote on Tuesday, April 5th. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, closing remarks from Heather DeLuca. Well, thank you for um, coming to the forum this evening and taking time out to listen to us. Um, I have been involved in my community. Um, I actually um, taught in Chippewa Falls for 33 years and I recently retired and I had to decide whether I wanted to live in Eau Claire or live in Chippewa Falls and I chose Eau Claire as my uh, community that I wanted to live in because of the amenities that it offered. Um, bus, uh, uh, transportation, uh, the university, the arts, uh, the bike paths, things like that. So I was drawn to Eau Claire um, versus where I actually was working. Um, I do believe government needs to be public and open. We need to make sure that we notify citizens of um, developments that are occurring in their area and they need to know in advance and in a timely, timely manner. I think we need to listen to them. They're the ones that are right around the development. They really know about that uh, area, so we need to take time. I would never want to shorten a meeting if it um, meant not hearing from people for about that issue. I also believe that uh, government needs to be very open and uh, we have to be a little careful about what we do in closed session. I think as many decisions and debates that can appear on the floor, for all people to hear both sides is very important. Um, I am an independent thinker, thinker and I do research. Um, when I was in teaching, I researched, I prepared, I was able to talk off the top of my head to my students in my classes, and so I'll bring that same diligence to the council when I go, um, uh, if I get elected. Um, and. Uh, um, if I don't know something about an issue, I am not afraid to seek out other knowledgeable people, uh, whether they be citizens or professionals or anybody who has the source of information that I'm looking for, I am, will be searching for that information. The more I know, the better I can make a decision. I'm not afraid to stand up for my convictions. 
Um, even if it means I'm the only one voting in that direction, uh, I will stand up for my um, constituents in District 1 and for my taxpayers um, at, in my district as well. Um, I just hope that you find um, I can do a good job for you and you'll vote for me on April 5th. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, for closing remarks, Tim Tewalt. Thank you. You know, I speak for a living. I'm an educator currently at CBTC. And this is humbling and nervous to speak before you because I respect you all so much. I've seen the city you've built. I know the people that are volunteering, working, and I'm humbled by that. I've had the great chance to serve on council for the last nine months, appointed in June, and I've seen this city as well run, that this city is cared for, and it attracts me even more to continue that. I love Eau Claire. I have a debt of gratitude. My children are now 21 and 22. They're prospering, and it is because of the joys and base that they got out of Eau Claire. I'm inspired by Dave Duax's legacy of a lifetime of just service and commitment. That is no mean feat to match, and I shall not fill those shoes if I'm elected, but I will continue to strive towards filling those. The choosing of council members is important. I believe I've got the unique blend of talents, a forward thinker, a hard worker, one who doesn't have to get their way, but one who prefers ideas and goals over agenda. Most describe me as forward thinking. I can work across all lines. I see it in a little bit of humor along the way. With integrity and honesty, I can meet the challenges yet to come. Eau Claire is a wonderful city, and the opportunities are real and before us. My experience dealing with change, how much change? Oh, good grief, never go into technology. It's been changing all my working life. And I continue to teach in technology. It's a fantastic opportunity to have. And so I ask for your vote. I ask for your support. I'm thankful that council giving me a chance to see what it's like. I believe I continue to be uh, the candidate that would be just wonderful. But I'm also in favor of whatever the public chooses. If you want to check out more, go to timtwalt.com. You know, Google anything close to that name, it comes up. What is that name? Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Tewalt. And we'll close off our closing statements with David Strobel. Hello, thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for putting on you know, the forum to everybody. Um, I, uh, I came to Eau Claire about 40 years ago to come to, to go to college at the university. I uh, met my wife there, graduated with a degree in finance, and uh, we've lived in the same home on the Eastside Hill for probably the last 32 years. Um, prior, prior to council, I served on the neighborhood association for over 10 years and, uh, and then also served on the planning commission for two years prior to being elected to council three uh, short years ago. Um, I own a business and I make a payroll. I, I own and manage a commercial building in downtown. And I think I use those real life experiences to help me ask good questions and uh, to contribute in a meaningful way to council decisions. Um, I come prepared. I think I work well with others. Uh, even though we don't always think alike. Um, I think we find areas of common interest, and, and I guess I would like to uh, continue serving on the council for the next three years. I can't believe three years have gone by. It's, uh, it was extremely busy and, um, and, and very, uh, very meaningful. Um, if I could put a plug in at all on, on something I'm a little disappointed about, though, I, I, would, I would hope that more people would step forward for public service. Um, we, have, we have an election tonight where we have five people running for five positions. And, and three years ago, we had 10 or 11 people running for five positions. Um, I, I just, I, I would ask my fellow, fellow citizens in the future to consider public service. Um, like Eric says, it's, it's probably, it's, it's not for the money. <laughs> we, we all serve on a lot of different committees as well, but I think it's very meaningful. And um, I would ask for your vote in April. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strobel. As we close tonight, a few thank yous uh, to the sponsors of the Candidates Forum, the Leader Telegram, WPO, WTV18, 790 Today, and WAYY, uh, the Chippewa Valley Sports and Information Station, Chippewa Valley Community Television, where you'll be able to see this, uh, and Eau Claire Area Chamber of Commerce. And on a personal note, uh, 
thank you to these candidates. They, they, they have different views, but they share one thing in common. They all clearly care very much about this community, and that's why they're doing what they're doing. I think they do deserve a round of applause. And remember votes. Tuesday, April 5th, polls will open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Thank you for attending the Candidates Forum. This program was recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.